Are we still talking about opioids? I thought that horse was long dead. Find out today on Medical History Mysteries. Welcome to Medical History Mysteries, everybody. I'm Pam Maragliano Munez. With me, as always, Tom Viola. Tom? Good. good to see you. So good to see you. But this topic, opioids. I'm... I feel like we're always talking about opioids, and there's always something new that's happening. What is going on? Well, uh, again, what's old is new again. And we covered this a little bit in our last episode when we talked about uh, uh, the uh, gas station heroin. But this, again, is an, a further uh, extension of that when we're finding, again, drugs that were discovered decades ago and found to be you know, too dangerous. You know, The risk outweighs the benefit. No, we're not going to pursue this as a drug stick this on a shelf somewhere and forget about it. And we did forget about it. Only to have somebody come along later and say, hey, check this out. And so that's what happened in the 60s and 70s. We did a lot of research on opioids and some opioids made the cut and some didn't. The ones that didn't make the cut, well, it was determined ultimately that, again, the risk outweighed the benefit. But now these same synthetic opioids have come back to haunt us because somebody... We remembered, if you will, or realized, hey, there was this uh, opioid we developed in the 60s, this synthetic opioid. It never made it to the market, but hey, this would make a great illicit opioid. This would make a great illicit drug. And that what are these? What are they called? What do we find? Like, what is their delivery system? What's like, why are they even here? Doesn't somebody just flush them down? I know we're not supposed to flush drugs down the toilet, but like, why don't they just destroy them or get rid of them safely? Because they're, believe it or not, they're easy enough to make. And if it's in the literature, you know, it doesn't take a a, a, a uh, somewhat unscrupulous uh, pharmacologist or somebody in this realm to redevelop the drug based on the recipes that were invented so many years ago. Okay, so nitazines, as they're known, these synthetic opioids, uh, these nitazine analogs, have recently be found recently been found in the Philadelphia drug supply. Poor Philadelphia, man, they they take it on the chin all the time because. That's where the, the fentanyl uh, uh, the, the fentanyl surge first happened, where then uh, xylazine was introduced into the fentanyl supply in Philadelphia. And there was a time, and I think it's still true, where you can't buy fentanyl in Philadelphia anymore without getting some you know, xylazine mixed in with it. Now, the nitazines are available, these synthetic opioids, and they're also incorporated into the fentanyl and the xylazine mixture. Uh, and at least five overdose deaths in Philadelphia have been recorded in the last two years. And the suspects uh, are growing. We think there's even more than a dozen overdose deaths could be related directly to these nitazines. And that's that's the unfortunate part because people involved in this world, in this realm, are trying hard to beat back this, this fentanyl crisis. And yet, as fast as we're doing everything we can to beat back fentanyl, more synthetic opioids become available because they're either as strong or stronger than heroin. And because, you know, heroin is sold in bricks that weigh a lot and are hard to conceal. These synthetic opioids are sold in little plastic bags, you know, a little plastic bag of fentanyl is enough to kill a whole city. So, you know, it's they're easy to conceal. They're easy to market. They're easy to, you know, transfer from one person to another. And so these health officials, not just in Philadelphia, but elsewhere, are, are having to deal with this influx of all of these synthetic opioids. And they're killers, man, because they cause overdose, they cause respiratory depression. And because if you're the person who uses this nitazine, and there's a couple of them, iso, is, isoton nitazine, I never say that right, uh, is known as iso. There's another one. Uh, that's out there that, that has a similar name, but the, the names are becoming colloquial names. So it's just called ISO, for example. Well, if you don't know what ISO is, 
you never knew that there was such a drug as isonitazine that that became ultimately a drug of the street. You wouldn't know what you were dealing with if that drug was first mentioned in a conversation. You wouldn't know that it was a synthetic opioid like fentanyl. You wouldn't know that it could cause respiratory depression. All you know as a public health official is this, this new drug called ISO. I don't know much about it. Or if you're a person who's going to use it, someone has told you, oh, you got to try this stuff, ISO. It's amazing. It's still an opioid. Now, if you're already using opioids and you've heard that this new drug, ISO, is available and you don't know it's an opioid and you use that along with it, you just doubled up on your consumption of opioid. That can easily lead to respiratory depression and death. And there's no test available. You can't buy a sample of fentanyl and have a readily available test to determine what other things are in it that are contaminating it, like xylazine, like this isonatizing. Okay? You, you don't know what those things are. And even if you did know, how much information would you have access to to tell you not to use it? And if you decided, okay, you know what, I'll use it, I always have naloxone to save me. I know this sounds weird, but this is a strategy for some folks. Like, okay, we're a team, you and I. I'm going to use this drug. You're going to have the, the Narcan naloxone ready in case something happens to me. And then it'll be your turn. Well, let's say you decided to rely on your friend and say, okay, I'm going to use this stuff I sell along with maybe some of these other things. And if you if things are going bad, you you get get me with the get me some Narcan naloxone. Your friend sees things going bad, uses the Narcan, and it doesn't work. Now what? So that's why it's unfortunate that these drugs are available because they were based on research done so long ago. And yet the awareness is so small, there's so little awareness that public health officials find themselves usually on, on the wrong side of it or on the short end of the stick because they just don't have the time, don't have the resources, and don't have the information to battle the newest you know, enemy in this uh, opioid epidemic that we're battling every day. That's really scary. So Narcan may or may not work with this. So even though we have this as a way to help some of these people to save them, it, it might not save them. What's the common route of administration? How are they taking it? Typically, it's oral. It's oral administration. Sometimes, though, it's injected. And, you know, again... I, I can't tell for sure if Narcan would reverse the nitazines, but I, I do know it cannot reverse xylazine. And it's hard to find an opioid strain or, or a supply of opioid that's available these days in Philadelphia and other cities where xylazine is not incorporated. You know, xylazine, as we've talked about before, is that veterinary tranquilizer that keeps you in this tranquilized state for up to 10 hours. Well, after six hours, the opioid is worn off and now you're still under the spell, if you will, of this tranquilizer for another four hours. By the time you come out of being under the influence of this xylazine, you're ravenous for another dose of opioid. And you'll gladly buy another supply of opioid from me that may contain, again, xylazine, fentanyl, and maybe one of these nitazines as well. Okay, so we're dentists, dental hygienists, dental practitioners. It's great to know about these things just so we sort of stay on top of it and have some, you know, even if it's limited, um, you know, awareness to some of these new drugs that are out there. Would we ever encounter a patient, you said like four hours after it's still in their system, could they conceivably take it at some time at night, come in in the morning, and now we're trying to, I don't know, give them local anesthetics or anything like that. How will that impact their dental appointment or are they so out of it, they're not coming to the dentist? Okay, so let's put it this way. I don't know if we'd be up against a patient who used a ninazine prior to a dental office visit or who used fentanyl or heroin necessarily prior to a dental office visit, but I can't rule it out because I may not be completely under the influence of nitazine, but I may have taken a little to maybe take the edge off. So I've only taken a small dose. It's not enough to make it apparent in my demeanor, in my conduct that I'm under the influence. But see, this is the problem now. If you give me, let's say I've come in for a procedure that involves conscious sedation, 
And, and now, you know, you're giving me uh, benzodiazepines, you're giving me propofol, you're giving me, you know, other drugs that are involved in conscious sedation. All of that can increase my risk of respiratory depression, or at the very least, make me fall deeper into sedation than you would want me to be. Uh, and for the dental hygienists out there, again, maybe getting my, you know, my teeth cleaned or getting some other hygiene procedure uh, is not very comfortable for me. So I might be using mm -hmm. nitazine. Uh, and I don't know what else that nitazine has been mixed with. So that could lead to unexpected, inappropriate behavior if, you know, for whatever reason, I find that uh, this procedure that you're doing is, is, you know, intolerable to me. So that's the greatest danger. I think it's to us as professionals, but also uh, us as, as person as people that, that that this person who I know is my patient, who's been my patient maybe for years, now under the influence of this drug, may not be that same person I thought they were. And, and to go back to before, Pam, just because I, I constantly have so many thoughts in my head, I can't always keep them in, you know, in this best order. There are test strips available to test for fentanyl to test for xylazine, but they're not always very accurate. So imagine your patient who's, you know, not so, let's say it's somebody who wants to try nitazine because why not? They've heard a lot about it, okay? They have the resources to afford the nitazine and to afford the test strip. So they do the testing, they find that, okay, you know, there's no fentanyl in here, there's no uh, xylazine in here. This is just the stuff nitazine people keep talking about. I'm gonna try a little. But you know, now I decide to use it, and at the same time, I'm scheduled for a dental appointment, or maybe I've seen the dentist, and the dentist prescribed me an opioid because maybe I had some unresolved pain. I've used the nitazine along with it, and now I've increased my risk greatly of respiratory depression and or withdrawal. So my concern is that that nitazine is the unknown here, much like fentanyl was not too long ago and xylazine is currently. It's it's what we don't know that we don't know that makes me concerned. It sounds to me that, and I know we've talked about this and this is not, this is not anything we haven't heard before, but it's so critical that we establish trust and we get our patients to open up with us and talk with us about what's going on for them. It's so easy to be like, any changes in your medical history? Nope. Good. Let's move on. Or, oh, you're taking these meds, no changes. Yep. Okay, great. And even though you may see changes in your patient, or even if they're a new patient to you, you just never know who you're going to connect with and who you're going to be able to tease this so important information out of so that we can either help to encourage them to get the care that they need or at the minimum treat them safely while they're under your care. So this is a sad topic. And I know I started this off like I'm sick of hearing of it, but I mean, the sad part is, is it's out there. It's real. And we just have to do our part to keep our patients safe and hopefully not add to the problem. And so knowing that there's new drugs out there, that there's new ways people are getting high and new ways that they're getting their opioids. Um, sad, but it's definitely something we must know about. So if we need more opioid videos, I'm here to shoot them. I'm not going to abandon ship. Sounds good. I'll be here to bring in the information, no matter how upsetting it may be. And I think awareness is the most important thing uh, we have as our weapon on our side. And I think it's a conversation, Pam, you know, I've always had this conversation with patients. It's, it's usually the same wording. It's it, basically, it's this, it's look, I don't want to know what you're doing, to be honest. It's none of my business, but everything you do can impact me and, and dental treatment today. Everything you do can have an impact on everything I'm going to use on you or to treat you with today. So even though I don't want to know, tell me everything because I need to know to keep you safe and protect you from harm. Most and definitely. So Keep your non-judgment eyes on, you know, and just listen to them and, you know, hear them out so that we can do the best thing. And in some cases, the best thing is to not treat them. You know, if they're under any sort of influence, you know, as much as we get pressure to produce every hour and produce every appointment and, you know, keep the practice running, sometimes it's in the best interest of the patient to walk them out the door. So if that's the case, better safe than sorry. I agree. Sounds good. All right, everybody, for Medical History Mysteries, we will see you next week. Thanks, Bye. Everybody.